Project Guru. 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 Всем привет! С вами Зак Новак на радиостанции Новорусия Rocks. Welcome to Новорусия Rocks radio station. This is Zach Novak, your American in downtown Donetsk. Program is called Project Guru. Guru's in the house. Guru, thank you so much for all the hard work that you do. And Andre, my engineer. Let's start off in Uganda. Really disgusting. Children mutilated for good luck during elections in Uganda. Six cases of the mutilation and murder of children as good luck sacrifices were reported during the recent Uganda elections, a children's charity said. Child sacrifice cases are common during election time as some people believe blood sacrifices will bring wealth and power. Cases reported from October to February, let me uh, pronounce these uh, districts correctly, Sembabule, Mokulo, Bukwea, Mubende districts in central Uganda. Suspects had been apprehended, but the cases had yet to go to court. President Yorawi Museveni won a February 18th election, extending his 30-year rule in a vote criticized by the United States and the European Union. Ugandans also voted in municipal and parliamentary elections. Moses Binonga, coordinator of anti-trafficking task force at the Interior Ministry, said children had been reported missing in the election period, but he could not confirm KCM's reports and said investigations were ongoing. He said seven child and six adult sacrifice cases were reported in the country in 2015, compared to nine child and four adult sacrifice cases reported in 2014. Bilonga said the mutilated bodies of children and adults had been found, some with hearts or livers ripped out. In two cases reported last year, the victims' heads were missing. In 2012 case, 82-year-old Hanifa Namuyanja was sentenced to 15 years in jail for taking part in the sacrifice of her granddaughter, Shamim Nalwoga. Police found the girl's body with her tongue and eyes cut out and genitals mutilated, the court heard. The United Nations said last year that the attacks on albino people in Africa were on the rise, linked to a growing demand from political hopefuls or body parts prized in black magic in the run-up to elections in several African countries. Quick news from Lugansk. Nazi scum Ukraine junta bombs our sister republic Lugansk, targeting civilian areas. Nazi Kiev troops shells positions in Lugansk People's Republic six times over the past 24 hours, including from mortars, a local freedom fighter member said on Wednesday. Nazi Ukraine forces open fire at Lugansk army positions near Krasny Liman village three times using 82 uh, millimeter mortars and small arms. The shelling comes from the direction of Trehizbenka village. Three local villages, Kalinovka, Logvina, and Jolte came under fire from an infantry fighting vehicle and small arms. There are no casualties. The ceasefire in the war-torn Donbass has been enforced since January 14. However, Nazi scum Kiev forces indiscriminate target of civilian areas trying to demoralize the brave people of the republics. But it's not working. Nazi Ukraine decree bans officials from criticizing government. Officials say move needed to restore public faith. The Ukrainian junta government has issued a new decree today barring all employees from publicly criticizing the government or any of its institutions or any of their colleagues. The ban is part of a new ethics code on loyalty and threatens disciplinary action against violators. Officials said the move to prevent criticism was necessary to restore public faith in the government after several damning leaks related to Yatsenyuk's government inability to get widespread corruption under control. Indeed, just two weeks ago, Prime Minister Yatsenyuk was asked to resign by President Poroshenko and narrowly survived a vote of no confidence by the parliamentary shortly thereafter. The effort seems designed to try to prevent a repeat vote. Guru, listen to this. Your guy, Rogozin. Russian Deputy Prime Minister Dmitry Rogozin has responded to accusations made by NATO terrorist organization Supreme Allied Commander Philip Breedlove that Russian forces used non-precise weapons in Syria. Shifting the blame, the specialists on bombing, the specialists on bombing Afghan weddings has accused us of non-precise bombing, Rogozin wrote on his Facebook page. Breedlove said on Tuesday, these indiscriminate weapons used by both Bashar al-Assad and the non-precision use of weapons by the Russian forces, I can't find any other reason for them other than to cause refugees to be on the move and make them someone else's problem. 
Russia's aerospace force started delivering strikes in Syria at facilities of the Islamic State and Jabrat al-Nasura terrorist groups both banned in Russia on September 30, 2015. The air group initially comprised over 50 aircraft and helicopters including Sukhois of 24s and 25s and state-of-the-art Sukhoi 34 aircraft. They were redeployed to the Kemenivan Air Base in the province of Latakia. On October 7, Moscow also involved the Russian Navy in the military operation. Four missile ships of the Caspian Flotilla fired 26 caliber cruise missiles, NATO codenamed Sizzler, at militants' facilities in Syria. The ceasefire between government forces and armed Opposition took effect Syria at midnight Damascus time, February 27th. An hour before the agreement entered into force, the UN Security Council adopted a resolution in support of cessation of hostilities in Syria. It is expected that the inter-Syrian talks will resume in Geneva on March 9th. Journalists wounded in Syria. Four journalists have been wounded in a shelling near the Syrian-Turkish border. Chief of Russia's Center for Ceasefire in Syria, Lieutenant General Sergei Kodalenko, said on Tuesday, a group of foreign and Russian journalists came under heavy artillery fire in the settlements of Kinsiva in a period from 12 to 12:10 March 1, 2016. Fire was opened for the settlement of Bidama and Syrian-Turkish border. Eight shots from large-caliber artillery were made. Shells exploded some 150 to 450 meters away from the journalists. As a result, four journalists from China, Canada, Bulgaria, and Russia were wounded, Kurlenko said. So as you can see, Guru, the Turkish junta trying to stop the media, trying to kill the journalists. The ceasefire in Syria hammered out by Moscow and Washington last week came into force at midnight local time on February 27th. An hour before the ceasefire became effective, the UN Security Council adopted a resolution to support the cessation of hostilities. The document drafted by Russia and the United States was supported by all 15 member states. UN Special Envoy for Syria, Staffan de Mistura, said 97 armed groups agreed to the ceasefire. The ceasefire is to be applied to all all parties to the Syrian conflict, but for Daesh, which is Islamic State, ISIS, and Jafat al naruza both are banned in Russia or other terrorist organization designated by the UN Security Council. Airstrikes on them will be continued. In the follow-up to joint statement by the Russian and U.S. leaders issued on February 22nd, a special center for reconciliation of the warring sides was set up at Russia's Himim Air Base in Syria's Latakia. Currently, 61 Russian officers are working at the center. The center aims to assist armed groupings in Syria in concluding ceasefire agreements, maintain the truce regime, control its observance, and organize the delivery of humanitarian cargoes to civilians. Back to Donbass. War crimes. Nazi Ukraine junta shells its own territory. Poroshenko junta regime once again targets civilian areas of Donetsk Republic. Nazi Ukrainian forces have shelled the settlement of Starobihailovka to the west of Donetsk from heavy weapons on Tuesday evening. Around 9.30 p.m., Nazi Ukrainian forces opened fire at the settlement of Starobihailovka and their own positions in the Krasnogorovka from weapons of 152 caliber. In total, the enemy fired 16 shells at Starobihalovka during the shelling. As for Krasnagorovka, Andre, listen to this. Intelligence should verify the exact number of shells. Intelligence sources noted that Nazi Ukrainian forces opened fire from the Gordyniak village to the northwest of Krasnagorovka, controlled by Kiev junta in three kilometers from the contact line. Intelligence added that Nazi Ukrainian forces might have shelled their own positions because of lack of coordination or in order to stage a provocation. Considering the the fact that talks on easing tensions in Donbass are currently underway in Minsk, Kiev may try to use this to disrupt the agreements necessary for the region by traditionally accusing the Donetsk side of the shelling. U.S.-backed terrorist ISIS hits funeral 40 dead. Yesterday's massive ISIS bombings in Sadir City's cell phone market meant a lot of funerals today, and ISIS was quick to double down on its attacks, hitting a funeral in Muqtadiya, attended by a number of Shiite militia leaders, killing at least 40 people, including six commanders. The slain included two local commanders from the Badar Brigade and four more from the Asiv al-Ahak, another faction in the Hashid Shah 
Al-Shabi, an umbrella group of Shiite militias that are fighting alongside the government against U.S.-backed ISIS. It wasn't ISIS only attack either, as they also targeted a military checkpoint on the outskirts of Baghdad, killing at least eight troops there. Between the two bombings, at least 58 people were wounded, many of them seriously. The situation in Diyala province, Muqtadiya, is still tense after the bombing, with large numbers of Shiite militia forces in the streets now patrolling, but very few Iraqi troops, bolstering recent reports that the Iraqi military is being spread thin by its attempt to build up around Mosul. Viva Assad, proud Assad forces smashing U.S.-backed rebels, gaining control of East Damascus. As the Syrian ceasefire continued to hold among the parties involved, the Syrian military pushed an offensive against Al-Qaeda's Nusra Front, which is not a party to the ceasefire, seizing territory from them just east of Damascus. The land is in eastern Ghouta and located in an important area between a pair of neighborhoods in the mostly rebel-dominated Damascus suburbs. The rebels, as usual, were none too happy, insisting it amounted to a nullification of the ceasefire. Yet the ceasefire explicitly excluded Nusra Front as well as ISIS. So the fact that the Syrian military is still fighting those two factions while galling for the rebels isn't a violation of the terms of the ceasefire. Rather, it was exactly what was intended as the U.S. and Russia hoped the ceasefire would shift everyone's focus to the Islamic groups. Many rebels had objected to the terms of the ceasefire in the first place, not liking the exclusion of Nusra Front since they depend heavily on Al-Qaeda's affiliate in the frontline battles and have Nusra forces embedded with them in many key rebel regions, exposing those regions to attack. Guru, to continue with that news, U.S.-backed rebels screaming betrayal, complaining to the U.N., while a number of isolated violations were reported over the weekend after the Syrian ceasefire went into effect Friday night. The situation, situation remains overwhelmingly one of calm, with the only significant clashes reported Monday between the Syrian military and Islamic factions who were not party to the ceasefire to begin with, which has put the rebels into an extremely sour mood as they were blasting the U.S.-Russia ceasefire talks as a U.S. betrayal to begin with and are complaining to the U.N. today of massive airstrikes that appear totally undocumented and unconfirmed by the usual monitors. U.N. Special Envoy Staffan de Mistura went so far as to respond to the rebel complaints by saying the situation could have been much worse and that the ceasefire was a major first step toward negotiations to an end to the civil war. That's a tall order, however, with the rebels seemingly as mad about the ceasefire as they were about the war and with the broad territory held by ISIS and Al-Qaeda, neither of whom are party to the ceasefire nor invited to any peace talks, it's premature to call the war resolved. At the same time, Mr. had suggested he call for a new round of peace talks if the ceasefire held through this week and so far, the indicators are promising on that. Guru Andre, last news of the day, and it's great. And I left it for the end, especially for the end. Nazi Erdogan's dream of an Ottoman Empire is nothing but a nightmare. Turkey is continuing to fall into an abyss, even though only a few years ago foreign media headliners were running headlines proclaiming a rising Turkey, and US and EU officials and experts describe Turkish leaders as modern, democratic, reform-oriented, pro-European Muslims. The West used to believe that Turkey could become an example to emulate for the less democratic Muslim countries in the Middle East, but now it turned out otherwise. The Turks will have to pay a high price for the revisionist ambitions and erroneous strategic thinking of their leaders. Turkish internal politics are in chaos in only seven months more than 170 people fell victim to terrorist attacks in various cities in Turkey, not including the hundreds more who fell victim to the clashes between Turkish security forces and the Kurds. Turkey is also submerging into chaos outside its borders. The country is conducting an ever more dangerous proxy war against the Shia and governments in Damascus, Baghdad, and Tehran, as well as against Russia, which supports them. Moreover, Turkey, with its neo-imperial ambitions, also views Lebanon, Libya, Israel, and Egypt as hostile countries countries. In Syria, the various actors, including Turkey, are all trying to grab the biggest piece of a small pie. Ankara's Islamist ambitions are no longer a secret, and neither are Iran's. 
The fact that Russia, whose relations with Turkey deteriorated, could surround the country using Syria, Crimea, and Armenia. Concerning Russia's deployment of forces to Syria after the Sukhoi 24 shootdown, Turkey looks helpless, and its NATO allies demonstrated complete indifference on the matter of assisting it in the event of a conflict with Russia. In order for peace to reign in the Middle East, several issues will have to be addressed, including will the Turkish Islamists realize that their neo-imperial ambitions are not matched by the country's power and influence in the region? Will the Sunnis ever manage to contain their religious expansionism? Will the Sunnis ever be able to stop radicalization on their own without intervention by non-Muslim countries? The answer is no. Erdogan, you are finished. Ottoman Empire will never happen. Everyone, as I stress always, everyone be safe out there, stay on alert. See you all on Friday. Bye-bye, folks.